went ahead. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers in Christ, we take our places here today in celebration and in awe. The good news of Christ Jesus is already at work, changing each of us and offering redemption to a broken world. It is Easter morning, and the glorious impossible has come to be. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. you remain standing and affirm your faith with me this is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved Christ died for our sins was buried was raised on the third day and appeared first to the woman then to Peter and the twelve and then to many faithful witnesses we believe Jesus is the Christ the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn of the dead, in whom all things hold together, 
in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the Christ, reconcile all things to God. The Lord be with you. It is tradition in many churches that we would greet each other on this morning with my speaking, Christ is risen, and your response, Alleluia. Let's try that. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Welcome to Corpus Christi First United Methodist Church, where our mission is to help people experience Christ and his infinite love available to all. And this day we celebrate that the one who died and rose for all is among us, is alive, is with us today, and loves you, and did that for you and for all the world. As we worship together, I want you to know that there is much happening in the life and ministry of this church beyond this hour that we're together for worship on Sunday morning, and I welcome you to return for other missions and ministries of this church. On the back of your worship program, you will see some of those opportunities. I encourage you to take a look and find just one place, maybe to just dip your toe in and connect in one new way with the church. I won't read all of those things to you, but I want to highlight that we have coming up soon the first Wednesday, every first Wednesday during the kind of the school year part of the year. On the first Wednesday, we have a create night in the fellowship hall with a meal and with a creative activity for all ages. That's coming up this Wednesday, April 3rd. We'd love to know you're coming. Let us know um, through the online registration or reservation form for that first. Friday concerts on the first Friday of every month year-round is a wonderful concert here in this space. It is free to you and we welcome everyone to come. It's a great opportunity for inviting a friend, bringing somebody, having a nice evening out with music. That's coming up this week on the 5th. Also, in the Easter season, um, there is a great 50 days that is the Easter season, we invite you to come for one of two Bible studies that are starting up. One is about praying in the messiness of life. Anybody resonate with you? Life may be a little messy and could use some ways to just kind of gird up your prayer for that. So that's starting week after next, as well as a study on uh, the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus. Look for details on the back of your program for those. I invite you now to stand and turn to those around you, offering signs of Christ's peace and welcome, meet someone new. And children, come on up during this time to the steps here where you're going to meet Miss Cherie for the children's message.
<laughs> I'm going to invite everyone to find their seats. If there's any more children that would like to come forward, you're more than welcome. We would love to have you up here. Come on up. Good morning. Happy Easter. Has it been a good morning so far for you? Yes. I know some people got to join me down at the other end for lots of yummy food and lots of fun activities. We had a great time down there. And we're filled with bright colors and all kinds of things. And we think about new life. New life. Huh. But what happened, let's think about three days ago, if anybody thinks about it, what were the people in the Bible, what were Jesus' friends thinking about three days ago? Were they happy or were they sad three days ago? They were sad three days ago. And why were they sad? Because Jesus had died. That's exactly right. And so they're going on Easter morning, and they think that Jesus is no, they don't think he's alive. They think he's dead. They think he's dead, and so they're going to take care of the body and things like that. Yet, when they get there, the tomb is what? Open. It's open. And is it full or empty? Empty. empty? empty. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Do you think they were, oh, no big deal, or do you think they were surprised? Yeah, they might have even been the word astonished, right? Now, what happens? Who can, who can tell me what happens when the tomb is empty? Some people think the women officially first think that, the, that someone's taken the body, that someone's stolen it, right? But who is at the tomb that tells them something? An angel or a man in white, a, peer, a person in white appears and tells them that he is not here he has risen right he they tell him he is not here wow but now they're they don't know what to do and then mary magdalene's in the garden and she sees a gardener and she wants to ask and the gardener says her name and who does she realize that the gardener is jesus yeah now think about that their friend has died and now he's back come back to life and he says go and tell all the people. Now, I want to go back to the Christmas story. Are you ready? We're going to go back to the Christmas story. Think about it. The angels appeared and the she to the shepherds, right? And they said, go and tell the good news. And so now, at the end of Jesus's life, what we th his life here on earth, he's come back to life, and the angel appears and says, he's not here and Jesus says, go and tell the good news. So, here's my question. What do you think our job is when we hear these stories? The story of Christmas and the story of Easter. To go tell the good news, to help spread the word, to go and tell the good news. So, here in just a little bit, we're going to have all kinds of eggs and cascarones and all kinds of fun things out on the lawn and we do that not because of any bunny or anything. We do that to remember to be astonished, to be surprised, to celebrate the new life and the hope that is offered to us through Jesus, right? And we need to go out and tell everyone we can about the good news that Jesus has risen. He is risen indeed. And Jesus loves you, and he loves me, and everyone out there. Let's pray, my friends. Dear God, thank you for your son, for his life, for his death, and for his resurrection. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to close it out. You guys, show me the cross prayer. You're going to reach your hands up and say, love God. Reach your hands out and say, love each other. Reach your hands across your chest. Give yourself a squeeze as you love yourself. And right here in the middle and say, amen. You may head back to your seats. I'll see you at the eggs later.
please stay please stand if you are able Today's scripture reading comes from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and uh, Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That seems like a strange place to end the story, doesn't it? They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, but that is where the Gospel of Mark ends the story. We'll see what happens next. So they don't say anything to anyone where Mark truncates the story, but clearly, as Cherie said to the children, somebody said something to someone, right? It's inevitable. It had to have happened. So. I'm going to do something you probably shouldn't do with the Easter crowd on uh, Easter Sunday morning. I'm going to probably make some of you very uncomfortable by asking you to talk in church. So I'm going to invite you in a moment to answer a question that will be on the screen for you. And the question is, where in the past week have you felt God's presence in your life or witnessed God's transformative love in the lives of others? It could be in the life of somebody you know. It could be in the news where you saw something like that. But we're, we're just trying to see. Pay attention. Go back and just quick reflect on the last week. And where's one place where you saw that God was doing something? Something was happening in your own life or in somebody else's life. So ready? You're going to turn to somebody nearby and just talk to them about that for just a minute. Ready, set, go. It's okay, talk in church. All right. I know not everybody got to tell their whole story, but it sounds like, it, like lots of you got to tell some story. And I know some, this is a harder thing to do because you're just not used to, to, to talking and telling those stories. But thank you for taking the, the chance here. So some of you, at least, had an answer to that. You've seen, just in the past week of your life, something that God was up to in this world. Maybe it wasn't like a huge transformation or, you know, resurrection level thing, but you saw that God was at work, that God hasn't stopped doing things in our world. Y'all, Jesus rose so that we might have new life through him, renewal in this life, transformation in this life, and for the life to come. And those who know about resurrection are called to be witnesses to it. So it was about a decade after Jesus' resurrection, after the first Easter day, when Peter had a dream. He had a dream in which God told him three times what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This is in Acts chapter 10. Well, around the same time that Peter had this dream, a man named Cornelius who was a captain in the Italian guard of the Roman military, also had a vision in which an angel spoke to him and told him to go get Peter. 
Well, the two men did not know each other, and both were puzzled by these dreams, these visions that they had, but they each paid attention to what God said to them. And in the end, each man experienced transformation. It is a wonderfully told story, complete with the wild stuff of dreams, all in grand detail in Acts chapter 10. So I don't have time to go into all the details of that whole story in this Easter sermon this morning, but I want to encourage you to open up your Bible this afternoon or this evening as a bedtime story and read Acts chapter 10. I promise you, it's one of the best stories, and it's good for grown-ups and children alike, so you can share it with your little ones as well. So Peter, with some hesitancy, does go with the people who were sent to retrieve him and take him to Cornelius. I say hesitancy because this was a time when the Roman Empire was not being friendly toward Christians, and so there was a risk of persecution for being known as a Christian, but Peter is obedient to what God said to him in the dream, and so he goes to the home of Cornelius, and he shares his personal witness to the resurrection. I want to read that for you. If you want to look at your Bible or Bible app, you're welcome to do that. I'm going to read it from Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 34. I'm reading it from a paraphrase of the scripture by Eugene Peterson called The Message. So here's what Peter says. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ everything is being put together again, well, he's doing it everywhere among everyone. You know the story of what happened in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. And he went through the country, helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do all this because God was with him. And we saw it, saw it all, everything he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem where they killed him, hung him from a cross. But in three days, God had him up and alive and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display. Witnesses had been carefully hand-picked by God beforehand. Us. We were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he is in fact the one whom God destined as judge of the living and the dead. But we're not alone in this. Our witness that he is the means to forgiveness of sins, is backed up by the witness of all the prophets before us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Isn't this marvelous? So here Peter is some decade or so, 10 years since the day of resurrection, and he's still telling the story with his own personal testimony, his own witness to these events. And he's telling it in this case that we read from Acts 10 to a Roman officer and his family in their home. And the whole family, I'm going to kind of give you a sneak peek. I know I told you to go home and read the story tonight, but the end of that story is that Cornelius and his entire household are baptized. They say yes to this good news that Peter shares with them. And they are Gentiles, Most of the early converts to the faith are, like Jesus and his first 12 disciples, Jews. And this story in Acts 10 is a turning point, a turning point in Christian history as the mission of the church expands to all people. This is good news for us because most of us would be in the category of Gentiles. We are like Cornelius, not of Jewish birth. On a more personal level, It's a story of new life for Cornelius and for his family as they become part of the way of Christ. I would just love to know what happened next with Cornelius and his family. How did this shape their family tree for generations to come? We don't have that piece of history. Sure would love to know. For Peter, this is truly a story of faith over fear in his willingness to take the personal risk to go and tell them. 
But this also points us back to Mark chapter 16, where Mark leaves us with this cliffhanger, with Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome fleeing in fear and saying nothing to anyone. But when we read on in the Acts of the Apostles, we see the evidence that the women's terror and amazement must have been transformed. They didn't stay there frozen in their fear. At some point, they steadied themselves from the shock of this news, and they witnessed to the resurrection. They took a deep breath. Maybe they had a cup of tea. And they heeded the instructions of the young man in white who was there at the tomb. And they told the disciples, including Peter, he singled out, that the resurrected Jesus was going ahead of them to Galilee, just like Jesus three times had told the twelve, where they would see him. And the other gospel writers, Matthew, Luke, and John, confirm this, that the disciples did witness the resurrected Jesus throughout Galilee, as Peter had told, later shared with Cornelius. Well, when Peter told the story of Jesus and pointed others to the power of God who offers us forgiveness and hope, he was simply testifying to his personal experience. He didn't have to go study it somewhere. He probably didn't have to rehearse it. It just bubbled up from what he had with his own ears heard, his own eyes seen. He had lived it. In the biblical Greek, the words witness and testify both come from the same root. It's martis, which is the root of martyr or martyrdom. We think of that word in association with those who pay the price with their life for testifying or witnessing to the faith. When someone testifies, they give their eyewitness account of what happened, what they saw, what they heard, and maybe how they reacted or responded to it. And being an effective witness, being able to be a witness at all, starts with paying attention, having something to tell. If you're not paying attention, if you don't see what's happening around you, you can't be a witness to it, a testifier to it. So there's a poem by a favorite poet of mine, Mary Oliver, called Sometimes. And I'm going to read you an excerpt from this poem. It has to do with paying attention. Later, I was in a field full of sunflowers. I was feeling the head of midsummer. I was thinking of the sweet electric drowse of creation when it began to break. In the west, clouds gathered thunderheads. In an hour, the sky was filled with them. In an hour, the sky was filled with the sweetness of rain and the blast of lightning. Water from the heavens, electricity from the source, both of them mad to create something. The thunder without a drowsy bone in its body. After the rain, I went back to the field of sunflowers. It was cool and I was anything but drowsy, and I walked slowly and listened to the crazy roots in the drenched earth laughing and growing. So why am I telling you this poem today? In the middle of that poem, Mary Oliver does something that seems so odd to me for a poet. Between the description of her experience of the thunderstorm and her after the rain thoughts, she inserts this stanza. Read this with me. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. How many thunderstorms have we been through and not paid attention to? How many God moments has your life been blessed to brush up against and you didn't take note? Instructions for living a life. 
pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. It's so simple. I don't know that Mary Oliver wrote this to be a gospel message, although she certainly reflects the stories of our scripture in many of her poems. This is a call to lift our heads and see what God is doing. God is still in the business of resurrection. God has not stopped transforming lives. I'm curious. I mean, you bothered to come to church on Easter. Now, I know some of you were dragged here. (laughs) And you know who you are. And the people in your company that came with you, they know who you are too. So some of you were dragged here. But a bunch of you came to church on Easter, made it a priority to do this when you had other options of things you could do today. And I have a hunch that at least to some measure, many of you are here on Easter because... God has done something in your life. You have experienced resurrection, transformation. It may have been 50 years ago that you noticed it. It may have been a huge moment or lots of little ones. But I just want to dare to say, raise your hand if you've experienced something like that. Maybe it's why you're here, maybe it's not. Okay. So you're a witness. You're a witness. The resurrection of Jesus is not only a one-time event, but is also an ongoing way of life that God offers to us. Because Jesus is raised, our lives can be made new. That's the good news. We are invited to be a part of resurrection, but we can so easily miss it. If we keep our eyes glued to our portable supercomputers, you have one in your pocket or your purse, don't you? We will be consumed by the message that the world is falling apart. The world is falling apart. I'm not denying it. Things are bad. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt. I thought about making a list of those things in the sermon. I had it written, and then I thought, there's no end to the list. I'm taking this out. They don't need me to tell them. If we look up from our devices, away from our screens, stop the doom scrolling, friends, faith can triumph over fear. And we can witness as the women at the tomb and Peter did, There is resurrection, there is victory, there is good news, and every single day it outweighs the bad. But the bad makes headlines. There's a lot of truth to it. But there is so much more good that God is doing. And we are invited to be a part of that resurrection story. Like the women at the tomb and Peter, we have choices to make every day about who and what we pay attention to and how we respond to that, about whom we believe and what we are going to do with that belief. You may have noticed the maybe not traditional picture of the women at the tomb on the title slide. Here it is again. The artist He Qi was born in China around 1950, coming of age during the Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s as a teenager. He Qi was sent to a communal farm to erase the effects of his parents' intellectualism. He Qi's Christian faith was forced underground to escape hard labor and to hone his skills As an artist, he painted portraits of Chairman Mao Zedong. During that time, he encountered an old magazine. I don't know what kind of magazine. An old magazine in which he saw a print of the Renaissance artist Raphael's Madonna and Child. He was mesmerized by it. It captivated him. And he began copying it. 
at night when no one could see what he was up to. And he painted it again and again, transforming it into his own signature, color-rich style, referencing Chinese folk art. Hutchie's life was transformed, literally by an image of Jesus, and by Jesus. And he tells about it through his art to this day. Reflecting on his life and his art and his faith, Hachi, now living in the United States, says, We are living in a time where there is much violence. There is little peace. We need to listen to the voice of heaven. Which voice are you going to pay attention to in this world? We need to listen to the voice of heaven. Pay attention to where you encounter the divine. Try this. I know, I've already given you one assignment. I've given you a reading assignment for bedtime. Now I'm going to give you a writing assignment. Try this. Get a little notepad, a scrap of paper, and put it next to your bed. And before you turn off the light tonight, and then again tomorrow, and again the next day, and again the day after that, write down one place, one moment, one glimmer, one glimpse of where you saw God today. And if you do that day after day, you will cultivate paying attention to God at work in this broken world and see that resurrection is God's way all around us every day. And then, once you get that habit of noticing those things, writing them down, maybe you could tell somebody else about it. That's how the gospel made its way to us. It's the only way that the gospel made its way to us. I'm up here preaching, and we're in this majestic, glorious church that points us toward God because somebody told somebody. Who told somebody? That's how the good news spreads. Thank God for the women at the tomb, and thank God for Peter, No need for explanation or defense of Jesus because all you have to do is tell your story of Jesus at work in your life. Simply tell the story. Jesus rose that we might have new life. If you know resurrection, be a witness to it. Amen. We celebrate Holy Communion today, the Lord's Supper. If you are new among us today, we want you to know that in the United Methodist Church, we have an open table. There's no prerequisite to receiving both the bread and the cup today. It's also okay if you don't want to receive for any reason. Um, You're welcome simply to stay in your seat or to come forward to kneel for prayer or um, let us know that you'd like a word of blessing instead of receiving the bread and the cup. As we gather at the table, we are mindful that always there are those who cannot be gathered in this place for health or other reasons. Particularly today, we want to remember one family from among our congregation who is in grief right now. We remember the family of Gerda Richter, who passed away this previous week. Gerda's visitation will be this coming Friday at 5 p.m. at Maxwell P. Dunn Funeral Home. Her service will be graveside at Seaside on Saturday at 1130. Our responses to communion will be the sung responses. If you would like to look at the music, it's on page 23 in your hymnal. Um, And I invite you to stand for the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and our greatest joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You hold all our days in your hand. 
the same hand that flung the spangled stars in the sky and sculpted the dust into human form. You breathed your life into us and gifted us with a balanced and holy world in which to live and serve. But we rejected your love, defiled your plan, and denied our creator. And yet you continued to woo us, Lord. You continue to sing your song of love through the prophets. Therefore, with all of creation, the eternal angels and all the company of saints we sing. Holy, holy, holy. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ on the night in which he gave himself up for us he took the bread and gave thanks to you and he broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you and when the supper was over he took the cup gave thanks to you and he poured it out to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. You may be seated. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now with confidence as God's children, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I said earlier, everyone is welcome to receive. Communion will be served by a method called intinction. Your open hands as you come forward is a sign that you would like to receive a small piece of bread that will be placed into them. You may then dip the piece of bread into the cup of grape juice, taking the bread and the juice together. If you require gluten-free, there is a small tray here, also at the midsection serving uh, area. And if for health or other reasons you prefer the prepackaged communion, those are available at both stations also. So a few instructions um, to move folks to receive. Um, those who are seated in the back half of the sanctuary um, or in the balcony, if you would please come to the serving stations that are going to be adjacent to the baptismal font. Those who are in the front section, you will come forward to receive up here. Everyone will return by the side aisles. Um, and I ask that those who are assisting would come now so that we can prepare to serve others. The 
blood of Christ. You're going to need to move from underneath for the choir. Oh, yes, ma'am. Servers, you will serve each other after you serve everyone else. Those at the midsection will serve each other back there. As the servers are moving into place, those who are going to the middle, if you'll proceed. Um, uh, Al, you're staying here. You go. Yes. We have too much bread and not enough. Yes. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Marshall, do you have everything you need back there? You do not. We need to send one more person with... What do you need, Marshall? Marshall? Bread, bread or juice? Bread. You need another bread. All right. Thank you. All right. We have figured out the math.
On Christmas Eve, we announced our Children's Literacy Initiative. We had already been gathering a team of people together, a team of about 12 people, where we had been doing work for about a year on this initiative. We began gathering funds for this initiative on Christmas Eve in hopes that we could have um, project transformation, which will partner our college students and our elementary students together um, to stop the summer reading slump. We would like to have that come to Corpus Christi. And we also would like to be the seed money for um, Do Dolly Parton's Imagination Library so we can start that for children under the age of five within the zip codes that we serve. So all of those funds are still being gathered. Those seeds are still being planted. But in the midst, we are still doing the work. We're doing the work of partnering and in increasing literacy opportunities for children in our community. As many of you already know, our children at Allen Elementary, which is our partner school, are experiencing where 50% of their students are below or well below the reading level right now. And so in response to that, um, we have already been partnering with them, um, doing, some, doing reading events, doing kindness nights, doing everything we can um, to help partner with them. You guys answered the call a few weeks ago when we put out that we needed readers to come and be reading with them every day. We have over 30 volunteers that are giving their time Monday through Thursday, at least an hour, um, each reader is giving at least an hour a day, and these range from all different types of people. And we are so thankful for you answering that call. We also, if you haven't gone outside, which I hope you do right after this for our Easter egg scramble, but we have our story walk, our spring story walk along the sidewalk, which you can find out two of our parable stories, uh, actually more parables than that, but two books are, are listed out there, and they're in English and Spanish. Again, this is in response to providing reading opportunities for all of the children in our community. And I'd like to give a special thanks to some of our volunteers who took it upon themselves to, um, they saw that the kids didn't have books at home, and so they brought books, boxes of books, um, to Allen Elementary. So all of those children on their last reading night just a week ago had books to take home. Thank you for being a church that makes children and makes literacy a priority in this community.
Our hope is that you have heard something here today that makes a difference in your life, and we encourage you to consider what next steps God might be calling you to take in your faith. We believe that following Jesus is following Jesus. It's a discipleship journey. It doesn't happen in a moment or a day. So pray about what the next steps are for you, and if there's something that you'd like to visit with me or Pastor Marshall about, um, whether it's a formal thing like being baptized or uniting in membership with the church or just, what do I do next? I don't know. We'd love to sit down and visit with you, pray with you, and help you in that time of discernment. Let us know, and we'll set up a time to do that with you. Starting next Sunday, we're going to have a series for the next five weeks in the Easter season. Um, on resurrection, resurrected from grief to new life. What happens after the resurrection? What do the disciples do with this? We have a number of stories of Jesus being revealed, the resurrected Lord, to his followers, and we're going to see how they grappled with that and what difference it made and how they moved forward. Come be a part of that with us. Let's join our voices in praising God.
Christ is risen. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's right. We started with it, and we're ending with it, and we're going forth with it. If you know that Christ is raised and have experienced resurrection, transformation in your life, be a witness to it. The world needs to hear it. Go with that good news in your heart and on your tongue. Go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit upon you now and always. Amen.